be as I am. My life is centered and my life is focused on Christ and Christ alone. Be as I am because I have been as you are. I became like a gentle. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 20. It says, unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21 he says to them that are without law like the Gentiles, like the Galatians, to you that are without the law of Moses, I came to you and as you are, so I am and so I want you to be as I am as well. It says to them that are without law as without law. Be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. You know what he's saying? I became like you are, that I might gain you, win you bring you to Christ so that I do not allow the Mosaic law or the circumcision or all those rituals to stand as a stumbling block between you and your salvation. I became like you are to save you, to serve you, to win you, and to convert you, and to bring you to Christ. Be as I am to also win me be as I am to, to uh, take and to keep my interest. I have sacrificed, I have denied myself, and now you are also to sacrifice and deny yourself. I must you are, be as I am. Look at verse 22 there. In verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Verse 23, it tells us, and this I do for the gospel's sake, that he is, I abandon the Mosaic law, I abandon the Jewish law, I abandon all the culture of the past. This I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 14. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I to the world. Galatian believers, brethren, be as I am. I'm crucified to the world and the world is crucified to me. All those things that glitter like gold in the world, I want none of them. All the things that tempt people and they want to submit and surrender their lives to the world, I want none of them as I am dead to the world. So be like me and be dead to the world. Already you see, I'm dead to the comments of the people in the Jewish nation. They might say, Paul, the apostle, what's he doing? He has abandoned Moses, he has abandoned circumcision, he has abandoned all those rituals, he has abandoned all the things that he used to do is now a new man he said i don't mind that because i am dead to the world i am crucified to the world i'm like you are like a gentile now so as to bring the gospel to you be like i am look at verse 15 in verse 15 for in christ jesus neither circumcision availeth anything no uncircumcision but the new creature, verse 16, it says, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Let's look at number two here. Number two, remembering the remembrance of Paul's preaching despite affliction. Look at verse 13 of Galatians chapter 4. You know, I was through infirmity of the flesh. I preached the gospel unto you 
at the first. He said, you must remember, when I came to the province of Galicia, there were difficulties, there were challenges, there was persecution, there was affliction, there was infirmity, but through the infirmity of the flesh, I didn't say, I can't uh, go there, I can't reach them. There are thorns on the path, there are pebbles on the road, and the road there is loopy and uh, tricky, and there are dangers over there. I came in spite of all the persecution, in spite of all the predicament, in spite of the infirmity, in spite of the affliction how I preach the gospel to you at the force with all those challenges actually everywhere Paul the Apostle went there were some difficulties and challenges and afflictions but he didn't mind look at first Thessalonians chapter 1 reading from verse 5 for our gospel came not unto you in watch only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. We acted as if there wasn't any problem. We acted as if there wasn't any challenge. We acted as if there wasn't any pain. We acted as if there was no affliction and no infirmity for your sake look at verse 6 in verse 6 and ye became followers of us and of the lord having received the word in much affliction in much opposition with much infirmity with all the pressure and the pain that came upon us we kept on going and we kept on preaching and we kept on pushing because your salvation was very much important to us with joy the joy of the holy ghost and then in verse 7 in verse 7 it says and ye became followers of us in verse 7 so that ye were examples to all that believe in macedonia and achaia the gospel came to you and you saw our sincerity and you saw our spirituality and you saw our sanctification and you saw our transparency and you saw that we were resilient we didn't mind the problem or the pressure or the affliction or the infirmity or the persecution when you saw that you became examples to and followers of us and to all that believe in Achaia and in Macedonia, then in verse 8, in verse 8, he tells us, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything then in verse 9 uh, for from you sounded out for they uh, themselves show of us what manner of entering in uh, we add unto you how ye turned to god from idols it pays to serve the lord it pays to keep on preaching and to keep on pushing on and to keep on persuading those seekers so they come to christ in spite of affliction in spite of infirmity in spite of persecution in spite of the trials in spite of the thorns on the way because it yielded the conversion the salvation the transformation of those gentiles they taught to god from idols to serve the living and true god then in verse 10 in verse 10 it says and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come to see multitudes of people delivered from the wrath to come from eternal punishment in eternal hell whatever affliction whatever persecution whatever infirmity we endure so we can bring that life soul saving gospel unto the people it's worth it we're looking at uh, number number three here number three response to paul's persuasiveness as 
an angel it tells us in galatians chapter 4 verse 14 and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not what does that mean uh, paul the apostle as i went about preaching the gospel there were times they stoned him and it left some scars on his body there were times they beat him and it led some weakness in his body there were times he was shipwrecked and that led some mark on his body and when you saw him you will see that this has been a persecuted man a beating man you will see that this man is a stoned man he had been stoned and you'll see that this man has gone through a lot and it was telling on his body yet in spite of that he went on preaching the gospel and he didn't mind that there were six scars on the face or six scars in different parts of the body or they will see that it's not like you know as agile as um, as able as physically fit as a teenager because of what he had gone through but all the same he said my trials my temptations which was in my flesh ye despise not nor rejected but you received me as an angel of God even as Christ Jesus that he is they received the word that was preaching as they would have received if an angel had come from heaven and spoken to them directly they received the gospel he was preaching to them as if Christ himself would descend from heaven and preach that gospel unto them as they will not argue with Christ they didn't argue with Paul the Apostle as they will not argue with an angel of God they did not argue with Paul the Apostle because they received him they received this message they received this ministry they received this ministration as if an angel of God had come to them preaching to them first Thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 in first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 for this cause also we thank God without ceasing because when when ye receive the word of God which ye heard of us you didn't look at our physical appearance at our weakness physically you didn't look at anything worldly anything earthly anything on earth anything of the world anything natural anything human but you heard the word of God you received the word of God which he had of us ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually walketh also in you that believe that's how you received the word of God Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 in Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 therefore wherefore then service the Lord it was added because of transgressions till the siege shall come whom to whom the promise was made and it was ordained it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator when the when the law came to the children of Israel angels took part in the proclamation dissemination and in the telling them of that law and then Paul the apostle said like you say now in chapter 4 when I brought the gospel to you it was like the angels brought the law to the children of Israel and without arguing with the children of Israel or with the angel how why when how should that be you received this the same when I gave you the gospel as if I was an angel of God I pray that that same attitude will continue to manifest in Jesus name I thought that quarters will say amen, amen. 
Let's come to number two now. Number two, their affection reflected in accepting the gospel. We're coming to first, uh, we're coming to Galatians chapter 4, verse 15. Where then is the blessedness ye speak of? Paul the Apostle reflected on the blessedness of the past, their acceptance of the past, and their readiness of the past in accepting the word completely as they reflected in this section. We're looking at number one, the former affection through God's grace. Number two, the failing attitude of the graceful Galatians. Number three, the fervent admonitions not for their good. Let's look at number one. Number one, the former affection through God's grace. It tells us in Galatians chapter 4 verse 15, it says, well, it's then the blessedness you speak of. For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your, eye, your own eyes and have given them to me. That's the love they had for him before. That's the affection they had for him before. They so appreciated him and were so grateful to God that a man shall come and show them the way to life eternal. That a man shall come and show them how to be delivered out of the darkness of gentle religion and to be brought into the light of the gospel of the grace of God. Of God. They so loved him. They so liked him. They so appreciated him. They were so glued to him in affection and intimacy that if it were possible, if he needed eye transplant, they would have plugged out their eyes and they would have given unto him. The same thing with the children of Israel when they first heard of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord, but the sin faded away. That's why Paul the Apostle now was saying, I could tell the blessedness, the affection, and the fellowship and the intimacy in the past. Where is that now? Where has that gone? Jeremiah chapter 2, reading from verse 1. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth. The love of thine esp espousers, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, I remember that long, long ago in a land that was not sown. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. The Lord looked at them and he said, Things are different now with you, Israel. When I look at the, at the past and I look at the blessedness, at the joy of following the Lord, at the devotion in following the Lord, at the obedience of the past, and as your attachment unto me, and I see you now, I can only say Israel was holiness unto the Lord. Actually, what the Lord desires, what the Lord demands, what the Lord delights in is not that we will be like that then and not like that now. He wants Israel to be holiness unto the Lord now. He wants the church to be holiness unto the Lord now. He wants you as a member of the body of Christ to be holiness unto the Lord now. He wants that same affection. He wants that same first love. He wants that same devotion. He wants that same transparency. And he wants you to remain holiness unto the Lord every day and every moment at every crossroad and wherever you may be, whatever may be happening. Holiness, it was uh, Israel was holiness unto the Lord and the 
first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, says the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 24, we're looking at verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. In verse 11, it says, And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Then in verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He does not want our love to wax cold. He wants us to continue. And he wants us to keep on loving him with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. He does not want to use past tense for our salvation, for our sanctification, for our holiness, for our service, for our affection, for our intimacy unto him. He wants it to be the ever present experience that the way we loved him in the past, we still love him like that today. But because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Then he says in verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What a revelation that um, the joy of yesterday is not enough for today. The faithfulness of yesteryears, that's not enough for today. And the commitment and the consecration and the love of God of yesteryears is not enough for today. It's not an historical experience. 19 such and such, 20 such and such, I was born again present day expectation of the Lord is a present life in holiness and righteousness. I remember many years ago I was sanctified. That's not enough. It was a present testimony. A heart that is purified. A heart that is circumcised. A heart that is holy, totally yielded and submissive to him on the altar. I, I, I used to have a high standard. A high standard of living for God. That's not enough. He wants that high standard of the word of God to be maintained until now and until he comes. That's why he said that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. In verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, in all the world, to the end of the world. Whatever is happening, there's pandemic, there's problem, there's plague, there's disease, there's a poverty, there's economy, there's this and that. Whatever is happening, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, unto all nations, unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It says we must increase in our reach, we must increase in our touch, we must increase in our penetrating our world with the gospel, that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached, shall be preached, and you must you must search to know how you know there are people that will say all i'm doing this is all i know it that's not enough in the world today this all i know this what i have learned things are changing and you must change if you don't change you become irrelevant i remember what we were teaching in those days i mean 30 years ago i mean 40 years ago and we we're teaching the normal normal teaching we used to use the chalkboard and we used to use our chalks and dust and everything that thing doesn't work today in education. If you don't know computer today, if you don't know how to use the internet today, if you don't know how to send your lectures, your lesson through internet today, if you do not know how to put your grades now on the media that those students will just, you know, they, they, they connect and they get their result, you are not relevant today. If you are the teacher of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and it is the old, old method, 
thought you will be out of service the same thing with the gospel as we have the gospel now and Jesus himself said that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations now the way um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, did it if he wanted to send his uh, testimony all over the world he'll write it down he'll put a horse there and then somebody will ride the horse and go to all those provinces you cannot do that today you use the media now and those who are sitting back in our church and say deeper life what are we doing now what do you what jesus wants done we're sending the gospel to all the world come on board and join us and whatever you can do bring your time bring your skill bring your money bring everything this gospel shall be preached in all the world and many will come to the Lord in every nation through you, through me, and through us together in Jesus' name. And somebody there will say, Amen. Amen. It will be done and you'll be part of it. I will be part of it. I will be part of it. The Lord bless the work of your hand for the salvation of souls in Jesus' name. And look at number two here. Number two here, the failing attitude of the graceful Galatians. Failing attitude. Look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Now, the attitude of uh, the Galatians uh, was winning. It was declining. It was going down. He said, I remember the blessedness of your love, your affection for me at the beginning. But now, I told you the truth. Now, I told you that Christ Jesus is the only way. I told you he is the only Savior. I told you nobody can come to the Heavenly Father. Nobody can get to God. Nobody can get to heaven except by Christ and Christ alone that the law of Moses will not get you there. Turning over a new leaf will not get you there. Religious observances will not get you there. Self-righteousness will not get you there. That's the truth. And now the blessedness that I saw before that you could pluck out your eyes and give that to me. I can't see that anymore. It's like now you are withdrawing yourself from me. I can't even see you. And I can't even talk to you. Where are you? It says, I might therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Now, that's about Galatians and Paul the Apostle. Let's talk about ourselves. Do you mind becoming your enemy because I tell you that without holiness no man shall see the Lord, that's the word of God. Am I becoming your enemy by saying that blessed are the pure in heart because only they shall see God? Am I becoming your enemy by telling you that if you are going to get to heaven, he gave himself for us that he might purify us from all sin and then it will so cleanse us and purchase to himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. I might become your enemy because I tell you that if you are indolent, if you are idle, if you are not working for God, if you are just like that, and Jesus meets you when he comes like that, that you will be a person that will be poor all through eternity. There will be no reward at all. I might become your enemy because I tell you wake up and reconsecrate yourself again and recommit yourself again and everything you laid on the altar before that you have taken away from the altar bring it back to the altar and let your consecration be beyond what it was many years ago and with all your heart all your soul and all your mind you love the Lord without reservation without a rival and without anyone to compete with your love for God as the truth I told you that will make you acceptable to God that will make you keep in the love of God and like Paul the apostle asked the Galatians I am 
also asking you therefore am i become your enemy because i tell you the truth we will not be enemies we'll be in unity together in jesus name as i'm pulling it up you are joining and you are pulling it up with me in jesus name as i'm running as i'm declaring as i'm persuading as i'm saying that this is the will of god even your sanctification you will say yes to everything you will say amen to everything your heart will be aligned to everything in jesus name uh, look at uh, first kings uh, chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 20 first kings chapter 21 reading from verse 20 and ahab said to elijah as thou find found me O mine enemy now those galatians who are now acting and talking and behaving like ahab ahab saw elijah and he said, as thou found me, O mine enemy. Now, Ahab, why did you say that? How could you say that? Elijah was a prophet of God. And he was sent of God to declare the word to the nation. And he wanted to bring the nation back to God. How could such a person be an enemy to you? He said, he answered, I have found thee. He didn't argue. Elijah did not say, am I your enemy? He wasn't afraid. Am I your enemy? He wasn't feeling lonely. You are the most important number one in our nation. And then you count me as your enemy. How could you say that Elijah said, yes, I have found you. Because thou hast sold thyself unto work evil in the sight of the Lord. I pray that the people God is using to touch our lives, to transform our lives, and to get us ready for the coming of the Lord will not count them as enemies in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three here, the fervent admonitions not for their good. In Galatians chapter 4, reading from verse 17, the zealously affect you. The Judaizers, the people that promoted circumcision, and the people that spoke about uh, the law of Moses, they were very, very zealous. They'll cross land, they'll cross the sea, they will use any means to bring their error and their falsehood onto the people. They zealously affect you but not well. It's not for your good. They will cut you away from the Savior. They will cut you away from the sanctifier. They will cut you away from the power that you need in your life. They will cut you away from concentrating on the way that leads to heaven and it will be like, you know, they take the precious thing, the gift and the grace and the goodness of God away from your hand and yet they do it lovingly lovingly if, they, if somebody loves you and is going to take salvation from you is going to take holiness from you he loves you always interacting with you he wants to bring you down from the top where you are where you identified with Christ and you're seated in heavenly places with Christ he wants you to bring he wants to bring you to the low level of the law of Moses and yet he's doing it zealously affectionately with smile with laughter and with good attitude but that's not for your good we need to understand uh, the difference between Paul the apostle and all those deceivers that were going to throw them down from the tower where they were they zealously affect you but not well yea they will exclude you they will exclude you with their smile. They exclude you from the salvation coming from Calvary with their smile and with their affection. They'll exclude you from the thing that Christ has purchased for us on the cross of Calvary with their smile, with their affection. They will exclude you from heaven. That's the important thing to consider. They will exclude you that ye might affect them. All they want is for you to please 
them for you to make them happy at the expense of your losing heaven make them happy at the expense of your being caught away from christ look at verse 18 in verse 18 but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing if you're going to affect anyone make it for their good what have i contributed to their lives have i raised them up how have i lifted them up what zeal have i given them what commitment have i given them if you're going to be friends with anyone you must ask yourself what's he adding to my life what's she adding to my life how is she helping me how is he making me to come nearer and nearer and nearer to christ it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when i am present with you uh, let us look at uh, romans chapter 10 reading from verse 2 romans chapter 10 we're looking at verse 2 for i bear them record that they have the zeal of god but not according to knowledge they have a zeal of god for the law for moses for circumcision for self-righteousness for rituals for animal sacrifice they have a great zeal of god but not according to knowledge the christ had died did he factor the death of christ to their zeal christ has provided salvation they didn't factor the, the the provision of christ's salvation into their religion they're still zealous as zealous as in Leviticus, as zealous as in deuteronomy but they overlook calvary and they overlook salvation and they overlook the savior and they overlook what god himself has said this is my beloved son hear ye him and any soul that will not hear him will be cut off from the people that was their problem the lord does not want us to have zeal without knowledge zeal without truth zeal without the gospel zeal without salvation zeal without the provision of christ from calvary and I pray our zeal will go along with the word of God in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, traveling ambassadors refocused on awakening to his grace. We're coming to Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. My little children of whom I travel in birth again until Christ be formed in you. What does that mean? It's giving us a picture of Christ standing at the door of their heart and knocking. That if anyone opens the door, I will come in unto him. I will dwell there. I will abide there. I will sup with him and fellowship with him. Now, he's using the picture that Christ was on the inside of them. But Christ had become powerless, impotent, like baby Christ. And it's not like a transforming Christ, a teaching Christ, an effective Christ, a mighty Christ, a powerful Christ inside them. And he says, now I travail now i persuade now i call you now i pray until christ becomes fully formed in you mighty in you powerful in you that christ will be what he is now with all his qualities and attributes and it will live big in you once again the christ of truth the Christ of knowledge, the Christ of power, the Christ of revelation, the Christ of vision, the Christ of mighty enablement. I'm praying, I'm traveling until Christ 
be fully formed in you now. Three things we're looking at. Number one, traveling until followers be fully persuaded. Number two, teaching until faith be firmly perfected. Number three, toiling until the faithful be finally preserved. Look at number one. Number one, traveling until the followers be fully persuaded so that they are no more up and down, in and out, sound and unsound, knowledgeable and ignorant. He wanted them to come to a level they're fully persuaded and nothing will change them again when galatians chapter 4 verse 19 my little children of whom i travel in path again until christ be formed in you and then in verse 20 it says i desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the sledge of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in which to deceive. Then in verse 15, it says, But speaking the truth in love, ye may grow up. That's what he wanted for the Galatians. That's what God wants for us, that ye may grow up in all things. In doctrine, grow up in doctrine. In deeds, grow up in deeds. In the demonstration of your understanding and your partaking of the gospel, grow up in all things. In love, in devotion to God, in consecration to God, grow up in all things. In the service of God, in reaching out further to the people beyond your culture that will grow up in all things, which is the hedge, even Christ, we will grow up. Every one of us, by the grace of God, in the knowledge of the Lord, will grow up in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, be not carried about for diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, the grace of salvation the grace of sanctification, the grace of for steadfastness. It is a good thing that the heart be established with grace and not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We're coming to number two here. Number two here, teaching until our faith be firmly perfected. Teaching until our faith be firmly perfected. A look at um, First Thessalonians chapter three, and we're reading from verse ten. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. That was the desire of Paul the Apostle, that anywhere he went, to any fellowship, assembly, congregation he went, he wanted to see their face, that he might perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Look at verse 13 there. In verse 13 there, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, Verse 28, when we preach, warning every man 
and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That we may perfect, present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Verse 29, in verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his walking, which walketh in me mightily. I pray that it will walk also in you mightily in Jesus' name. Number three here, we're toiling until the faithful be finally preserved. Toiling and walking until the faithful be finally preserved. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 10, that she may approve things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Amen. We don't know Christ will come, but every day and every moment, we so live our lives in the grace of God that we are sincere and without offense, offense towards God, offense toward man, when without offense till the day of Christ. In verse 11, verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. I pray you stand firm, you stay committed, and you stay stable and steadfast until the very end in Jesus' name. If that's going to happen, Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verse 25. But that which ye have already, that which ye have already, Christ knows we have something already. The angels know we have something already. Paul the apostle knew that the Galatians had something already, but the Judaizers were trying to take that out of their hands. I have something. You have salvation, you have something. You have sanctification, you have something. You have the service of God in your hand, you have something. You have the love for God, you have something. Uh, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. Who is going to hold fast? Steadfast until the end. Where are you? Hold fast until he comes. And the grace of God abide in your life in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. That good thing that we have, the salvation, the experience, the power, the glory, the godliness, the presence of God, every good thing we have, hold fast until it comes.